Well, welcome everyone. My name is Heather Knoll and I am the program coordinator at Sustainable Woodstock. Founded in 2009, Sustainable Woodstock is a not-for-profit community and environmental action and education organization. We exist to lead our communities through the climate emergency, empowering Woodstock and the rest of the Upper Valley to meet climate commitments and live sustainably through advocacy, education, and collaboration. This event is a part of our Green Drinks series, and Green Drinks are social events to connect people who have similar interests. And now I am very excited to introduce you to our speaker tonight. Emily Ruff is the director of Sage Mountain Botanical Sanctuary, a center in Orange, Vermont, founded in 1987 to foster opportunities for conservation, education, and healing. A practicing herbalist and educator for over 20 years, Emily relocated from Florida to Vermont in 2018 to continue the legacy of her mentor, Rosemary Gladstar. Now, welcome, Emily. Thank you all so much. It's such an honor to be here with you tonight, um, tuning in from Vermont, um, not too far away from y'all. And um, when I lived in Orlando, Florida for 20 years prior to living here, um, I was part of a drink, green drinks community there. So um, it's really lovely to unite with you all. And uh, I wish I could be with you on Tuesday in person at your tea party. As an herbalist, I have quite a fondness for tea parties. So mixing those with electric lawn care is just like the upper echelon of social events. So um, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I tonight will be sharing about um, Vermont's ecosystem through the lens of our work here at Sage Mountain and hopefully offer some ideas for those of you, um, whether you have a small backyard or some land that you steward, um, or even if you're just renting a little place there in Woodstock, some ways that you may um, contribute to the movement to protect Vermont's um, amazing and incredible ecosystems. Um, yeah, so the title of my chair tonight is Protecting Vermont's Ecosystems Backyard Strategies for Corridor Conservation um, at Seu. Went right to the end. It was a great presentation, everyone. Thank you. Here we go. Um, here at Sage Mountain, um, we steward 600 acres. Um, in what's known as the um, Upland, Orange Uplands Corridor. Maybe if I go backwards, give me a preview there, there we go. Um, so we have 600 acres here in Orange, just north of uh, Route 302. Um, in 1987, my teacher, herbalist Rosemary Gladstar, um, founded this center as a place for healing, for education, and for conservation. For 30 years, she offered classes and programs here related to medicinal plants and conservation. And when I took over stewardship um, several years ago, we started offering youth programs. So we currently have a full-time after-school youth program and summer camp nature program. Uh, in June through October, we also offer family and adult programs like day visits, weekend classes, private retreats, and garden internships, as well as all year round doing a lot of work in conservation uh, research and advocacy with a lot of state agencies and other nonprofits and community organizations to um, fulfill our mission of protecting the medicinal plants that we love and the ecosystems where they live. So, um, just we'll share a quick video here um, that's a little bit about Sage Mountain so that you can um, get a get a sense of where we're located and a preview of the work that we're doing. Sage Mountain Botanical Sanctuary is a 600 acre wilderness retreat within a contiguous forest spanning over 80,000 acres in central Vermont. Founded by herbalist Rosemary Gladstar over 30 years ago, this land provides a sanctuary where plants, animals, and people coexist in harmony while cultivating personal and planetary healing. Expansive and diverse ecosystems, from forests and rare fens to our cultivated gardens, provide home to an abundance of wildlife, including moose, bear, bobcat, fisher, and fox. These same ecosystems are also home to diverse flora that make this sanctuary so rare and rich with medicine. Threats to our wildlife's unique habitat continue to grow due to climate change and development. 
Now, more than ever, protecting biodiversity is not only critical for the health of the planet, but also for our own survival. At Sage Mountain, our mission is to restore critical ecosystems, advocate for conservation of wilderness, programs focused on earth stewardship and principles. We invite you to join us as we continue a legacy of conservation, education, and healing. So there's a little glimpse of our land um, and the corridor where we live. Um, I love seeing those drone shots and getting an eagle eye view of um, this little mountain that we're situated in. You can see in this image that we are um, just at the southern edge of the Groton State Forest. We're actually part of an 80,000 acre contiguous roadless forest. Um, and it's designated by the state of Vermont as highest priority landscape, watershed, wildlife corridor, and in Vermont conservation design, a number of other really high priority landscape designations. We have an immense um, amount of biodiversity here in this corridor and on our property that we steward um, that provides um, a rich environment for rare plants, for wildlife, for riparian habitat, as you saw those images of um, some of the animals that uh, are our neighbors and allow us to live on their land. Um, I was recalling just last week we were checking some of our camera footage and we found what's called a blonde coyote. It's a little bit different from an albino coyote, but it's equally as rare. Um, a blonde coyote had just visited a few weeks ago, um, which just gives me goosebumps saying it out loud and just thinking about um, the beings that um, share this land with us. So. Um, so you can see on this map that big kind of red thumbprint. We're right at the southern edge of that. And it's um, a big part of our mission, not just to foster biodiversity and protect the um, ecosystems and the different habitats here on our 600 acres, but also to work with our neighboring landowners and um, other the state forest and, and other landowners in this corridor to um, really help protect the biodiversity that's here. Um, so uh, uh, biodiversity, the biological diversity, I feel like it's a term that in a lot of sustainable circles is kind of a buzzword. Um, so really it for us is a founding principle of conservation on a hyperlocal as well as a larger level. Um, and really honoring the variety of life on this earth at all levels um, from the different microbes in the soil here, all the way up to those uh, larger megafauna that call this land home. And um, really thinking about biodiversity in 2024 in central Vermont, as we're all recovering from the impacts of climate change and floods and, you know, various um, evidence of the changing climate, really thinking about what does biological diversity mean and how is the concept of stewarding biodiversity changing alongside climate change? Um, there, you know, I think is this real evidence of the fact that we as um, humans are stewarding land that's changing in ways that both we contributed to the change and also that's like ecological and, and era related change, evolutionary change. So, um, thinking about biodiversity in ways that how can we foster and support the variety of life on the planet? Um, so let me pause real quick um, and just take a quick moment here to, I'm having a little technical issue, so I'm just gonna pause my video for a second, Heather and hop. All right, can you see me, Heather? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Sounds great. Thanks. So what I wanted to talk about today was um, strategies of conservation that we apply here at SAGE, uh, but talking about them through the lens of backyard conservation and hopefully giving some of you some ideas um, of ways that you can contribute to supporting and protecting biodiversity, whether you have a little tiny backyard plot behind a condo or stewarding a couple acres yourself. Um, so I've sort of categorized these in different sort of areas, and one of those is plants. So um, Plant backyard strategies. Well, the first thing that I really want to emphasize is um, how can we 
support plants that are um, native to our ecosystem and verify that we're not bringing invasive plants into our gardening. Um, focusing on gardening that uh, inspires diversity and not monocropping. Um, and also not just thinking about avoiding bringing invasive plants into our garden, but also um, managing ways that we might see invasive plants. Um, so one thing that came to mind recently at a talk I was at was folks that go canoeing might pick up different aquatic plants on their canoes. Um, and so the importance of hosing down our boats before we um, move them to a different waterway or similarly hosing down our boots. Here at Sage Mountain, we've been really fortunate that we don't have many invasive species yet, but we know that ecology is changing and the climate is changing. So we, we know we're always keeping an eye out for them. Uh, we have a little, little bit of Japanese knotweed at the bottom of the mountain towards the road, but the only other species that we really have of significance is garlic mustard. Some of you may know garlic mustard. It's an edible. I love folks that say, well, just make pesto out of garlic mustard and that's how you can manage for the invasives. If you saw the garlic mustard patch that moved into Sage Mountain, we would probably feed all of Woodstock and all of Vermont with the garlic mustard pesto we could make from it. So it's not necessarily a practical solution. But one thing I was just yesterday out kind of managing that patch as I do every spring and early summer. And I always hose down my boots um, or my shoes after I've been pulling uh, Japanese knotweed or after I've been pulling garlic mustard because many invasive plants are incredibly opportunistic. I actually have to give them a lot of respect and credit. They can often spread vegetatively and not necessarily through seeds or roots. So a little bit of a garlic mustard leaf that got caught in the bottom of my boot, if I walk that into another area of my land, I could be unintentionally spreading that. Another thing that I'm really passionate about is um, sourcing our firewood locally so that we're not unintentionally moving around things like um, ash, uh, emerald ash borer and other things. So being really mindful about bringing in firewood from other places that could um, take pests around. Um, Composting at home to keep the cycle going. Uh, anytime my students say, what's the first step in gardening? I always say starting a compost pile or bin or whatever strategy works best with the land in the area that you have. Um, and also thinking about harvesting rainwater as a way to reduce water consumption um, for watering the garden that you're establishing. Of course, many of us, when we're thinking about our gardens, we're thinking about how can our gardens support pollinators. And I always recommend um, planting for pollinators. Here at Sage Mountain, we have about three acres of managed and tended garden outside of the wild land. Um, and a lot of it, as when I moved in, I inherited a lot of medicinal herbs and, and other flowering plants and perennials. Um, but we really try to, with any of our management of the garden going forward, take a focus on native plants. How can we um, plant for pollinators, but not just turn on Instagram or look on Google and say, what should I plant in my pollinator garden, but really get a focus on native plants from folks like Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and their botanists and see what are the plants that we can use that will support pollinators from a native angle so that we're not unintentionally, for instance, planting an ornamental milkweed that might be lovely for a subset of butterflies, but not necessarily for native butterflies to our region. I also am a big proponent of no mow May. It's May 30th. So if you've been able to, up until this point, uh, not mow your yard, congratulations. If you've been participating in no mow May, I know for some of us it is easier than others to let those dandelions go to seed. But the purpose behind no mow May is really that in this ephemeral time of year, as the summer is moving in, um, leaving those weedy plants to flower is an excellent source of nectar for the pollinators and food for them as the rest of the plants start to mature. Um, outside of the practice of no mow may, if you're able to leave wild edges in your yard or places where you intentionally leave weeds, depending on how much space you have and how much your HOA allows it or not, um, it's a great example of ways you can continue to support pollinators throughout the growing season. Another way you can support both pollinators and amphibians in your yard is avoiding raking those leaves up in the fall, um, if possible and where possible, even similar to wild edges, if you just leave a patch of leaves um, that creates some incredible habitat for pollinators, also very protective habitat for amphibians. 
Um, avoiding neonicotinoid pesticides. If you do have to use pesticides and herbicides, um, try to use some of those organic options. Um, and then something that I think we forget about a lot as it relates to protecting pollinators is protecting the darkness of the night sky and limiting light pollution. Um, so turning off your lights or having outside lights that are motion sensor detected, right? So that you're not just leaving the light on all the time, but only having it on periodically. Not only is that helpful for local pollinators so that the moths aren't just incessantly banging their head against your light outside your porch, um, but also for migrating birds and pollinators, the more we can protect that dark sky, the more we're really contributing to um, both pollinator and aviary health. And I want to just mention that coming from Florida, which is not a dark sky state by any means, uh, we have a real gift here in Vermont. Um, to have one of the highest ranking dark sky states in the country. So finding ways that we can um, limit light pollution uh, is not just a joy for looking at the Milky Way, uh, but also uh, for protecting pollinators and birds. Um, so thinking about strategies that um, are helping our wildlife, any of those that I've talked about so far are really gonna be helpful for wildlife because plants and pollinators, it's an ecosystem that builds on top of each other, right? So when we're protecting plants and the ecosystems they live in, we're also protecting the ecosystems where the wildlife live. But I think one of the most important strategies for me um, to think about whether you live in a rural or an urban area is honoring the fact that at the end of the day, we live in the home, the original home of these wild creatures. And so one way to acknowledge that and to protect them is thinking about ways we can prevent conflict. Um, so one of the things that comes up a lot in my area, in the town of Orange and in Orange County, is the conflict that happens when we don't properly secure our trash and the bears waking up from hibernation or getting ready for hibernation in the fall are wandering around furiously searching for food and they find our trash. And then it becomes a challenge because many homeowners feel like the bear has impeded on their territory. The bear feels like we built our houses in its territory. Um, and it just doesn't end well for anyone. So really using bear secure strategies for our compost and for our trash feels like a bare minimum step that we can take to protect wildlife in our region. Um, one of my students recently was sharing with me some really interesting information about bird feeders. Uh, you know, most of us think putting out the bird feeders is really helpful um, for the bird population on our land, and, and certainly it can be to an extent. But one thing that I didn't realize before is that visiting birds to those feeders can sometimes pass disease between each other. And so um, this expert that we were learning from was sharing that we should, um, when we're going to refill our bird feeders, actually empty the seed, hose down the bird feeder, and then refill it with fresh food every time as a way to prevent the passing of disease from the visiting birds that might be um, coming to our bird feeders. I know my bird feeders bring me immense joy in the depth of winter, and I, you know, kind of feel like I'm doing something good for the birds when really they're doing something good for me by visiting outside my window. Um, so the least that I can do is try to prevent the passage of disease um, by assisting, um, by hosing down those bird feeders. Another thing that um, I think some of us take for granted is placing decals on our windows um, so that the birds don't think that those are um, through flyways and try to fly in and then injure themselves. Um, all sorts of sun catchers and beautiful decals or things that we can hang on the windows off of suction cups are ways that we can really protect the birds in that way. And as a passionate cat lady, I am also equally passionate about um, if you can't keep your cats inside 100% of the time, being very diligent in um, getting those like um, bird safe collars. Um, the ones that I have for my cats, I trust that they love and think are fashionable, although I'm sure they roll their eyes when I come at them with them, but they're like, they look kind of like clown collars. They're brightly colored. They have little bells on them, but they're really helpful deterrents to keep our domestic cats from getting our bird population. And 
you know, I know a lot of folks think we should keep cats inside 100% of the time. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I know it's not always practical, especially if your cat is um, also helping you with, you know, other pests in the in your natural community. So thinking about um, just being really diligent if you can't keep your um, feline companion indoors all the time, um, getting those bird deterrent collars and having those very consistently so that you're still protecting the bird population where you live. One thing that comes up in a lot of my talks here locally in Orange County um, is what do we do about trees in our backyard if we find that there's a tree that is dying or that, um, you know, is at risk of uh, falling on your roof? What do I do? Do I cut it down? Do I not cut it down? Um, and most of the uh, holistic forester foresters that I've worked with over the last seven years here in Vermont um, really advocate that it's not inappropriate to cut a tree if it is at risk, um, if it has limbs falling, if it's a danger to you and your family, but just cut those big limbs and then leave as much of a trunk or a snag as you can. Those snags make such excellent wildlife habitat. Um, and, you know, they're not always necessarily the most aesthetic, but I have neighbors that have decorated them or uh, put faces on them or, you know, made, made something of them excuse me, in their backyard uh, that makes it actually a feature and not just the appearance of like, why is that dead tree trunk standing there? Um, but those make such incredible habitat for pileated woodpeckers and for hermit thrush and for um, other birds that would be a real delight to visit in your yard. So um, so that's uh, definitely a recommendation. If you have to cut down a tree in your yard, just leave as much of the trunk there as you can for habitat. Um, avoid releasing fish or plants into the wild. I imagine that's not likely something that any of you have really thought about, but if you do keep an aquarium, I know I ran into this a lot uh, when I lived in Florida. Folks would say, oh, well, this is a tropical fish. I'm just going to put them in the local lake. Um, and both the fish and the plants that you might keep in an indoor aquarium can actually um, overtake the local fish and plant population and be really detrimental. If you're fortunate enough to have a pool to take a dip in in the uh, summer months, um, always keep that pool covered when not in use. That's something that um, I was a part of the Vernal Pool Monitoring Project this spring um, through the state and did a lot of studying about amphibians and wood frogs and salamanders. And one of the things that um, is really unintentional by a lot of landowners that have pools is when they leave their pool uncovered, um, it's an easy way for amphibians to drown. So always covering your pool when it's not in use is just a good protective measure. And then one of my favorite recommendations uh, is documenting your wild neighbors with cameras. Um, this is something that I think brings me a lot of pleasure. We have about 25 cameras staged throughout our 600 acres that rotate from season to season and allow me to see that blonde coyote I mentioned or the moose or the bear that you saw in that video. Um, it allows me to see um, the health of those animals. Um, we had uh, an injured bobcat and then an injured raccoon uh, that we were able to identify and make some measures towards um, supporting them because we saw them on our cameras. Um, it's also a wonderful way that I'm able to share information with local agencies and state agencies like Fish and Wildlife um, so that, you know, hey, we have moose going through this area, like you might want to know and count that and document. So a simple trail camera um, usually costs, you know, 50 to to $100. It's a great activity that you and your family and your neighbors and your kids can engage with. And um, it's just a wonderful way to get to know the wildlife that live on your land and that are allowing you to cohabitate with them. Uh, and also to, you know, study, um, check in cameras and, and share research with others. So, um, so uh, getting involved um, locally and at the state level um, is something that is, you know, rooted in the desire to protect your backyard and the corridor that it's a part of um, and something that will take you a little bit beyond your backyard, but is a part of backyard and, and local and citizen scientist conservation that I feel like goes hand in hand with research and documentation and some of the other protective strategies that I've spoken of so far. Um, engaging your elected officials from the town level, your select board, your council, all the way up to your senators and House of Representatives. In fact, right now, I'm going to encourage you to call Governor Scott and your legislators 
um, because Governor Scott just, I think this earlier this week or late last week, vetoed um, a bill that had passed uh, that would limit the use of neonicotinoid pesticides in the Vermont farming industry. And it would be a very, very supportive bill for the health of our pollinators and the biodiversity of our pollinators. Um, so that you can take that as your first assignment of homework from tonight's talk and call your uh, representatives and call your, your senators. It is the end of the biennium, but they will be returning for um, a veto session in June to sign off on some things. And so giving them a call and say, I support the B bill, please override that veto, um, is a way that we can, can be effective in playing a role in policy. Um, the folks that you see here, my partner, um, from who's our Sage Mountain Director of Wildlife Programs is featured in this photo, and these are some folks that were testifying um, at the House of Representatives this year on a wildlife bill that got tabled. Um, it wasn't, uh, it will be reviewed in the next session, but the same group of folks um, also testified on a bill that bans the sale of bear gallbladders, um, which is something that uniquely in the United States, Vermont was one of the only states that still contributed to an underground trade of bear organs um, over to Asia. And so they successfully got that bill passed by calling their senators and their House of Representatives, writing those letters. Um, the Margaret Mead quote, never take for granted that a small group of citizens can uh, impact the world. Indeed, it only has. That's a paraphrase, not exactly what she said, but the spirit of that is something that I think about all the time when I think about these small groups of citizens that make great change at the state level through policy change. So um, it doesn't have to be the state level. Your select board or your planning commission might be making some policy that affects local waterways in your area or um, development strategies in your area. So um, I always really encourage um, in the state of Vermont, we I think have a unique access to both local and state government that not every state has such an open door. So I encourage you to learn about what's going on, especially at the town level. Is there a recreation committee or a planning commission? or a conservation commission in your town. In fact, I imagine I'm preaching to the choir and probably a lot of you serve on your conservation commission. Thank you for your service if you do. Um, but these ways of participating really make an impact on conservation uh, of the ecosystems that we have here in Vermont. I also wanna give a plug to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and their community wildlife program. Several times a month, they have both in-person and virtual workshops that they offer on a variety of different topics. Um, and they also have an extended training called the Environmental Leadership Training that is either a four or six week class. All of their programs are totally free. Um, every program that I've taken, I've learned so much that I've been able to apply to my own backyard. Um, and plus I get to geek out with other folks that love wildlife and love plants and love ecosystems. So um, I really encourage you to look into Vermont Fish and Wildlife. They have an incredible YouTube channel with a lot of their past workshops on there and also a webpage where you can sign up to their upcoming programs. And then, of course, thank you for being a member of Sustainable Woodstock um, and staying connected and building these communities. I really think of um, groups like this and green drinks and events like this as really the mycelium of the conservation movement. And um, Vermont, we can be really, uh, you know, distanced from one another. We, you know, may live in a rural area and not connect as socially as often as uh, we might if we lived in a big city or a more dense state. And groups like this are doing such incredible work to help us build these relationships that help us learn together and grow together and teach one another. Um, I wanted to close um, with an encouragement to think about redefining what conservation and nature looks like. Um, one of the most inspiring books that I've read in the last several years is called Rambunctious Garden by an author named Emma Maris. Uh, she subsequently wrote a book that's more focused on wildlife called Wild Souls. Um, both of those books have been profoundly impactful for me. And in Rambunctious Garden, the subtitle is Saving Nature in a Post-Wild World. And when I was earlier thinking about the, um, the slide about um, biodiversity, and I mentioned, you know, the definition of biodiversity is really kind of changing as we're looking at climate change and, and what do the plants and the ecosystem in Vermont, what are they going to look like? And 20 years or 30 years or 50 years as temperatures continue to rise and precipitation changes, will the plants that we think of now as sort of a pristine Vermont landscape even be able to survive? 
will I, with all of my prejudice against garlic, mustard, and Japanese knotweed, have to uh, open some tolerance or acceptance for plants that are moving into this ecosystem? And as climate changes, maybe the plants that thrive as other plants aren't able to. Um, I think it's a very nuanced and complicated conversation. And Emma Marist does a great job at speaking to some of those complex questions in this book. So um, I just sort of wanted to offer that in closing as we think about our backyards and keeping them native or, you know, introducing new species, managing invasives. Um, you know, I rattled off a bunch of ideas that I practice in my backyard for conservation of the Vermont ecosystem. Um, but I also hold open um, the understanding that my mind have to ch might have to change and my practices might have to change as the climate changes. Um, and so the book Rambunctious Garden has just been a very hopeful call to action uh, to keep our minds open as the climate changes and, and to consider how we can move into this new era and work um, not against nature, but with nature. So, um, so with that, thank you. Uh, I would love to see how any of these ideas landed for you. Um, it looks like there might be some questions in the chat or um, otherwise. So yeah, thank you all for letting me ramble a bit and share. Thank you, Emily. So we're going to be taking questions in the chat. Um, if you guys haven't used Zoom chat before, go down to the bottom of your screen, click on more, and then click on chat, and it'll open up the chat on the side. You can enter your questions there. Um, okay, so first question from Steve is, could you recommend top five pollinators to start with? Steve, are you thinking pollinator plants or what kind of pollinators are you hoping to attract to your yard? The actual six leggeds or what plants do you want to plant in your yard to start with them? Um, oh, and I see that Steve has also offered the suggestion of braiding sweetgrass. Um, so I'll ramble about that for a second as I hear from you, Steve, about plants or pollinators. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, if you're not familiar with it, is definitely top three in my recommended reading list. Um, she also wrote a book called Gathering Moss uh, that I feel like is such a mossy landscapes are just so quintessential to our beautiful Green Mountain state. So I think that's just such a pull such heartstrings for me, that book Gathering Moss. And this fall, she's releasing a new book called The Service Berry uh, that I just am waiting with bated breath to get my pre-order copy. So. Definitely, those are great, uh, great recommendations. Um, I'll just start with saying that I, as an herbalist, am uh, deeply indebted to the pollinators in my garden. And um, as a relatively new resident of Vermont, um, I know not how to identify all the native pollinators all the time. I rely on my friends at Fish and Wildlife doing field visits with me or National Resource Conservation Service to um, kind of offer some of the most important pollinators that they are that we're hoping to attract. Um, I know, for instance, the rusty bumblebee every time my um, etymologist friend comes over and he sees it in my uh, wildflower patch, he gets so excited. Um, and of course, monarch butterflies up and down uh, the eastern seaboard are, are species of, of peril right now. I guess you could say like pollinators um, in peril. Um, there, I would say, are um, there's a list that I can actually, I'll, I'll put in the chat in a second, of some of the um, endangered species and threatened species of pollinators that we're sort of the most concerned about in the state. Um, but in terms of plants that you might want to put in your garden, um, you said top five. Well, I want to give a real plug for common milkweed, um, Asclepia syriaca. Um, there are a number of different milkweeds that you can get if you go to Claussen's or Gardener Supply or different gardener stores, but really looking for um, the Asclepia syriaca. Or if you have a more wet environment, Asclepia incarnata, um, those are the two species that um, are really going to be the most supportive to a number of different pollinators. Um, Solidago, I think, is also going to be in that top five for me. And there are at least four 
species of goldenrod in my meadow that are native to Vermont. So there are probably more than four species native to Vermont in general. Um, but goldenrod uh, is such a beautiful autumn blooming plant that is an incredible pollinating supporter, um, really easy to access, really beautiful in the landscape. Um, another that I'm a big proponent of are the asters, uh, whitewood aster, big leaf aster, um, New England aster with that beautiful purple uh, flower. Um, those really have a wide variety of um, different pollinators that um, are supported by those asters. Um, I think I've said three so far. Um, I want to give a plug for Monarda wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, the species that's native to Vermont um, or native to New England, rather. Um, marsh marigold is another one um, that is, I think, just a, a very, I'm thinking about one, Steve, that have a broad uh, list of pollinators that can support them. Um, and in the early part of summer, white trillium and red trillium uh, are two that are really helpful for pollinators as an early bloomer. Um, I will share a list in the chat um, of the sort of, it's not top five, it's probably top 20. Um, I, as I said, those top five, now I'm thinking about like bone set and a lot of other common ones. So uh, it's hard to ask a plant person to narrow things down to a small list, but um, I'll share that uh, list with y'all in the chat so you can take a look at that. Thank you. Um, so next question from Steve, has sustainable Woodstock looked to expand to other abutting communities, i.e. Queechee? Um, so we, we, we do serve the entire Upper Valley. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ginevra. Um, I can a bit. We cover Queechee, um, yes, but we don't do certain types of work. Like we do a lot of local town advocacy for the town of Woodstock that we don't do for local towns. That said, we have um, advised other communities locally who are trying to do the similar work, including Sustainable Lebanon, um, which has grown a lot in the past few years. So it's a matter of um, getting a group together for some of the local advocacy. But if you want to host an event in Queechee, we've done stuff with the Queechee Garden Club. So just reach out. Lovely. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, so from Sarah, do you have recommended management strategies for jumping worms? Sarah, that is uh, really a loaded and difficult question. Um, jumping worm, some of you are probably familiar with the invasive jumping worm. It's a, a, a mynthus species. I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, they There are three similar looking non-native species in that genus. Um, and the the best way to manage them is by prevention. So um, for me, that looks like making my compost at home and not getting deliveries of compost from other services um, and really just, you know, keeping our our material here on the land. Um, the, the next most important thing is really inspecting plants that you introduce into your landscape. So if you go to a garden center, like before you put that plant in the ground, like taking it out of the pot and really carefully inspecting it. I know a lot of folks like the, the master gardener who uh, for 20 years was overseeing the gardens that we have here. Um, she's very insistent in her home gardens now or other gardens that she works at. She will only bring in bare root plants. She will not bring in potted plants with soil because prevention is really kind of the best way. But for most of us, uh, including here at Sage, we were not really aware of jumping worms existing until they came and were in our garden and then we had to figure out what to do with them. Most of us sort of, um, they they arrived, the crazy worms, the snake worms, the Jersey wigglers, Georgia jumpers, there's all sorts of names for them. They arrived uh, very quickly and then we were like, oh no, they're here. Um, so prevention for a lot of us, we've already gotten them and it may not be very helpful. Physical removal is the only way I'm aware of addressing them if they're detected. There's not any known chemical controls or organic chemical controls um, that I'm aware of that exist currently. So um, for us, it means that this time of year, uh, we're probably several weeks behind y'all in, in your gardening, both because we're more north of you and because we're about 200 
uh, sorry, 2200 feet elevation. So our gardens are just coming in right now. And so we're out there picking out all the maple seedlings. And as we're doing it, we're really carefully inspecting the soil um, and just physically removing them uh, as we find them. And then our land manager is taking them and going fishing or something with them. I'm not sure. So um, yeah, so those are the, the tools that I'm aware of. Um, if you all have any other ideas, I'd love to hear about it. But that's that's what my my best understanding from and and you'll see some resources also on the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website about jumping worms that that um, can be helpful too. But yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, so this from Heartland, Vermont, a suggestion. There are also inexpensive escape ramps for small critters that pool owners can buy. We don't have a pool, but I've seen these online. Um, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Maybe while we're waiting to see if anyone has any last questions. Emily, is there anything you want to share about, like if people want to come visit the preserve, that sort of thing? Yeah, well, I just um, put our um, oh, frog logs. That's cool. I like that, Daniel. Um, I just put our website and our email in the chat. Um, so uh, we would love to um, have you visit. We're in Orange, Vermont. Uh, we offer day visits and um, different uh, plant internships. We also have summer camps if you have kids from four through grades four through eight. We do six weeks of summer camp in nature um every summer and we also offer some weekend classes and private retreats and group rentals um we also try to have a lot of information about the plants and the wildlife on our website um so you can spend some time wandering around we have a youtube channel where we try to put up all those beautiful videos that we get on our trail cameras of the wildlife in our area um so lots of lots of ways you can uh spend some time on your device checking out sage mountain on our website and on our youtube channel um but yeah we some of you may be aware last summer during the floods um our road washed out about a mile of our road and so for several months we were closed so we're really excited uh that our road was fixed uh, just before winter and that we're able to um welcome with open arms guests to the sanctuary again so um really really excited to be open uh this weekend with june being our first weekend that we're open would love to see you all for a day visit or a retreat um i also want to give a plug for an organization that uh, i serve on the board of and that was founded here at sage mountain called united plant savers um the mission of united plant savers is medicinal plant conservation so plants like ginseng and gold seal that um, some of you may have growing in your landscape, wild ginger, other medicinal plants that are um, exceedingly becoming threatened due to habitat changes, as well as to industry and poaching and stuff. Ginseng in particular, uh, a plant of concern with poaching here in the state. United Plant Savers is a national organization um, that has a lot of focus here in Vermont on the medicinal plants um, that we have here. Some of you saw um, on our video or one of my slides, uh, Cypripedium, uh, the showy lady slipper. We have a calcareous fen here as one of the rare habitats that we steward. Um, and between summer solstice and July 4th, we have a huge bloom of thousands and thousands of uh, showy lady slipper in our fen, um, which is always a um, real treat to welcome guests to see those. But that's one of those medicinal plants of concern that United Plant Savers works um, to advocate for. So uh, United Plant Savers also has lots of cool monographs and videos and more information. Those of you that have interest in plants in general or herbalism, I encourage you to check out that website too. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I also just wanted to thank you for bringing up um, the the legislative side of things. Uh, it's It's so easy to get lost in what we can do on our own properties, which is lovely. But um, definitely been an interesting, uh, I don't know what to call it, legislative year season session. Um, and I was just curious if you had any idea on what's going to happen with the neonicotinoid, ne I can't say it, neonicotinoid um, bill. I have a strong sense that um, there will be a number of bills uh, that will be vetoed by the governor before the June session um, that will be over overridden. <laughs> by um, the senators and the representatives. I mean, 
that bill in particular um, did pass with a, a fair majority of support. It was not one of those that was kind of like right on the line, uh, like other bills that may not pass um, the veto session. But that one feels one that um, I really strongly believe is going to pass. But the more of us call our representatives and senators in the weeks leading up to that veto session, uh, well, they'll, they'll reconvene only for like a few possibly days, I think June 17th or thereabouts is when they'll be coming back into session. The more of us that email and call um, and let them know that we'd like them to support that bill and override the veto, um, the more likely it will be. And again, I you know I said earlier, it, it has been striking to me what um, open doors there are at both local and state level for um, advocates to um, connect with representatives and get involved. You know, I think probably most rural states with small populations have that similar ratio. Um, but like the lieutenant governor once a week has a coffee hour that we can all go to and have coffee with, you know, David Zuckerman and like tell him all of our complaints and issues. And like, you know, he may not be able to do much about some of them, but he hears and the governor also has these um, these opportunities. And so, um, yeah, if you've never, you know, reached out and introduced yourself to your elected official, um, you know, they, I, I firmly believe that they, um, appreciate hearing from us and even if they don't always agree with our perspectives on wildlife or conservation um they they work for us and uh it's our job to tell them how we feel about things and and to try to make that change happen so on the b bill on the neonic um i do think it's going to uh, that the veto will be overridden but um i certainly am going to call all of my folks and keep sending emails and encourage other people to do the same so Thank you. Yeah. There's um, an, two organizations that I'll highlight, and there's actually lots of others. So, um, but Rural Action uh, has been a champion of that neonicotinoid bill, um, and they have great action alerts and keep their constituents and members and followers engaged in what's going on during the legislative session because. Um, if you've never worked in, you know, advocacy or lobbying before and you see, you know, it, it's just like a maze in a circus and it's impossible to really navigate what's going on very clearly. So they do a great job of advocating and, and supporting. Um, and NOFA, the um, Northeast Organic Farming Association, has also been a real advocate of that bill in particular and also sends out a lot of farming and land related action alerts. So those are two organizations that um, I follow and, and have a lot of resources for folks like us. So I'm curious if rural action, did you mean rural Vermont or is this rural action? And I don't know about rural action. I mean rural Vermont, but there okay. is a group called Rural Action, which is actually uh, a national group that does do some work on medicinal plant conservation. So thank you for correcting me. Rural Vermont uh, is who I- know about the other one too. <laughs> Yeah, Rural Action does some cool things with like ginseng projects and stuff, so. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Emily. It was so nice to have you join us tonight. And um, I also just want to mention again, our next event is going to be on Tuesday, June 4th at 5.30 p.m., Electric Lawn Care and Tea Party. Would love to see some of you all there if you want to come and try out electric lawn care equipment or if you have something that you really love that you want to bring and share with your neighbors that would be super helpful and we'd love to have more machines there so uh, please come on down at least to get some cookies and tea with us thank you all for having me tonight and have fun at that event i look forward to connecting with you all soon yeah thank you so much good night everybody thank you